Okay. So welcome to episode 48 of the Liberty Dad podcast, where we prepare for tomorrow's political conversation by how we engage today. If you're new to the show, Liberty represents the message of all your freedom all the time. And dad represents the delivery, recognizing tomorrow's conversation with my son is determined by how I engage with him today and then applying that to those around me. I'm your host, DL, and this episode is Putting in Work with the Liberty Movement, where I am joined tonight by Harrison Kemp. And tonight we'll be discussing what we are doing in the Liberty Movement, challenges that we've faced, and offer some insight to motivate others to do that thing that I know you've been thinking about, but doing, but hesitant to jump into. So we'll go ahead and dive right in. As soon as he comes back, because Harrison is getting himself a beverage I prepared already, and I have my tea, which seems to be going in and out of focus, but that's all right. So as soon as he gets back, we will dive in. Effectively, what's going on, things are a little bit different tonight. I have, uh, I was having a little bit of trouble with the episode that I wanted to produce. And so instead, I set it aside because I don't want to slop something together and then put it out. So I contacted Harrison and I said, hey, man, you want to jump on the show with me and we'll talk about something a little bit different tonight? And he said, yeah, sure. And so in thinking about the topic that we would do, I said, you know what, let's talk about what we're doing in the Liberty Movement, because I am not only hosting this podcast, Liberty Dad, I am also the chair of the Libertarian Party here in Duval County in Jacksonville, Florida. And there are other things that I am doing as well that are somewhat related to the party, but kind of distinct on their own. And so tonight we're going to talk about those things and we're going to talk about the things that Harrison is doing. We're going to talk about free speech media, this network that I am joined with uh, along with many others. And we're going to talk about some of the challenges that we faced and some of the things that uh, we're doing to hopefully motivate others. So if you're watching the show and you're like, man, I've been thinking about doing this one thing, but I've been a bit hesitant to do it for whatever reason. Hopefully tonight we'll give you that gumption to push you over the edge and get you going. And I see that Harrison is back. Harrison, are you ready? Awesome. Not a problem. Awesome. That's great. So tonight we're going to be talking about some of the things that we're doing. And one of the interesting things is I know that you're working on the FSM uh, network, but I don't know what other things you're doing. So let's go ahead and lead in with some of the things that you are doing. And we'll just kind of have a casual conversation tonight about the things that we're doing, the challenges that we faced and, you know, what, what things that others can, you know, kind of grab onto to motivate themselves. Gotcha. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Right.
Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. What has been the the biggest challenge that you've had to face that you were not expecting? Mm-hmm. Gotcha. What has been the the biggest challenge that you've had to face that you were not expecting? Uh oh. Mm hmm. Gotcha. Right. What has been the the biggest moment, challenge everybody. that you've had to face? that you were not expecting. I'm adjust my camera real quick. Uh oh. All right, let's see if hopefully that works. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Right. What has been the, the biggest moment, challenge everybody. that you've had to face that you were not expecting? I'm adjust my camera real quick. Uh -oh. All right. Let's see if hopefully that works. Ah, there we go. I am now able to be heard. DL, are you there, my friend? Yes, I can still hear you. I am adjusting my camera a little bit. All right. It doesn't look like I'm looking down so much, uh, even though I technically am. Uh, folks, like I said, I've got a different setup tonight. I am actually not in the Liberty Dad studio, which is basically an office that's half painted green for my green screen. Uh, I'm actually downstairs, and the reason for that is because my son happens to sleep next to me, uh, next to my office, and we are streaming this live. So this is actually the first live episode of Liberty Dad. Uh, I did it because I was running a little bit short on the topic that I wanted to do, and I was like, uh-oh, got to adapt. So here we are. All right, so you were telling us that you basically have, uh, you know, the challenges that you faced you were kind of expecting them. Why is it that you were expecting some of the challenges that you faced? Well, it's because before I started on the path to being vice chair, to you know, deciding to run for office, to writing a book, to trying to get legislation done, before I got into any of these things, I actually spoke to people who already do them. You know, it kind of comes back to that being prepared for the task ahead of you. If gotcha. you're going to be in the liberty movement and you're going to actively be involved in nullification efforts and in fighting the state, you have to understand the monster you're fighting. You right. need to understand how much money it's going to cost, how much time it's going to cost. You need to realize that it, there is a dedication that needs to be made. You, right. know, you don't have to spend your entire life to it. And please, for the love of God, do not. But you need to realize that if you're going to do it, you have to jump in with both feet. So I had talked to representatives. I had, mm -hmm. uh, you know, spoke with some people who ran or are part of institutes and just asked them, like, look, how much time does this take? How much um, how many people can you expect to support me? Yada, yada. So they kind of gave me an idea of what I would be looking at. And from right. that framework, I just moved ahead. So I already knew that the state was going to make it as difficult as possible to get any filing that I ever need done. You know, they're, right. they're, they're not going to make it easy for me. Um, I learned that I already knew that the media is not going to want to talk to me. You know, right. I'm going to need to find other sources of media if I'm going to get people interested in what I'm doing. Uh, I already knew that the my my competitors, the Republicans, the Democrats, the people who want to expand the state, I already knew that they are going to have a giant leg up. So there was no surprises. 
-hmm. I think the biggest surprise really at the end of the day, the one thing that no one can really warn you about is just how weird it is to be in a situation where representatives are calling you like, and they're like, Hey, Harrison, can I, can I pass this bill by you? Like no right. one tells you how weird a spot that is to be in. Gotcha. You okay. Know? And, and that says the vice chair of the state party, correct? State party of Maine. Well, I'm the vice chair for the state party of Maine. I'm also the treasurer and legislative director for a political action committee. Gotcha. Okay. So. Gotcha. I, I'm actually the chair of a, of just the Duval County. So, um, just a single County here in Florida. And so I don't, nobody's calling me necessarily to ask me about legislation, but I, but I find some interesting, I actually kind of have a different experience, uh, you know, as the, as the chair now, and I started out as actually nobody. So the way that it worked is I came to Jacksonville and I was, I believe I was registered NPA and uh, I started kind of flirting with libertarianism, you know, kind of saying, you know, I think that there's something here that I could, I could grab onto. And so I went to a couple of meetings and we had a chair at the time who abruptly stepped down and nobody was willing to take the chair role. People had asked me, I'd only been like, you know, there are two, maybe three meetings and people were like, Hey, would you like to take the chair role? And I was like, I have no idea what the chair role does, what it is. I don't know anything. So I was like, Nope. And what happened and what, what kind of caught me off guard was the affiliate was disaffiliated because you have to have a chair, uh, not only by, uh, I think more importantly by the state rule, but, um, so we disaffiliated and there was no more libertarian party here in the County. And I was kind of frustrated about that, but I had met several people who I felt kind of were a bit in the know. They kind of knew what was going on. They knew some of the players, at least locally, they just kind of had a, you know, they had, they had a bit of a grasp. And so I, I called them up and I said, Hey, we need to get this started. This is not acceptable. So they came over to my house and uh, several of us sat and planned and kind of worked out what we were going to do. And we got it stepped back up, you know, set back up. And there was a few bumps along the way. And I decided that I would take treasurer. And I think I, I think I started out as secretary and then eventually I moved on to the treasurer and then, um, after a while, after some new people came in and, uh, you know, I supported, you know, we had, we had a couple, we had a little bit of turnover as well. And our last chair was a really good chair. Um, I, I, I liked her a lot and she did a lot of things very professionally, which is one of my big, big things. Like if you're not going to be professional, I'm just like, go away. And at any rate, something came up and she had to step down. And so I said, you know, I think I now understand the role of the chair better. Um, and by that time I had not only been the secretary and the treasurer from the local affiliate, but I'd also participated on the rules committee for about a, for, for a full term. Uh, well, just under a full term, uh, I replaced somebody for the state party and I had started to kind of get familiar with, you know, the state party and, you know, got more familiar of course with the local party. And, um, so I stepped up as chair and it's been an interesting ride. Um, I think the one thing that's a little different from my story from yours, you know, you say, Hey, people were contacting me to read bills and, 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 you know, find out about them. I feel like it's been largely, um, a situation where people are looking to me to really lead, like, where are we going DL? You know, not to say that everybody is a follower per se. It's not what I'm getting at. Just more like, what's the vision for our affiliate? You know, well, what are, what are you, where, where are you taking the bus so we can either get on board and really, and really move it or probably vote you out. Right. <laughs> At least I hope, I hope they would. I hope they would, if that's not what they wanted. And I would say that you bring up something important, which is in the Liberty movement, if you show up and just start doing things and organizing people and getting stuff going, as long as you've got your wits about you, you're not a crazy person. People right. are willing to work with you. Oh yeah. They're even absolutely. willing to, to follow you. 
You know, and I oh, yeah. would say that I do think most people are followers. I don't think most people are leaders. I don't even think most people who are in leadership positions are necessarily leaders. I, right? I've had that criticism of a lot of organizations that I've been in. Yeah. <laughs> Not, I, you know, business, uh, real estate, uh, uh, the, the uh, political parties. Yeah, it's it's there for sure. But it, in, you know, let's say that you have an organization that doesn't really have a couple of leaders. You know, you don't have that one solid person everyone can rally behind. That's fine. As long as you realize that, as mm -hmm. long as no one's under the false impression that just because someone is chair, they're therefore running everything, you know, right. be realistic about it. Like if the person and don't be, you know, don't be a, a rude or condescending to them about it. Just be open right. and honest. Be like, hey, we all know that this is a volunteer thing. There's only 20 of us who do anything. Right. Uh, if you need extra help, reach out, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, in my experience, because that's pretty much what I did, DL, I just kind of showed up and started doing something. You know, mm -hmm. I showed up, I had bills in hand, I started reaching out to groups who wanted to pass legislation. And that's how I got involved with the party. Right. So when I came to, it came to convention time, I was like, all right, well, I've already got a significant portion of the party knowing who I am, supporting what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Uh, it just, it didn't seem right to run for chair, just, you know, the way that right. the party is mm -hmm. and whatnot. And plus I would have had no idea what to do as chair at that time. I had never been in, right. in mm -hmm. party politics. And so I ran for vice chair. I don't think anyone voted against me. No one ran against mm -hmm. me. So, you know, it, it was one of those things where now I'm in a leadership position. Well, mm -hmm. at this point, me and the chair came together and said, all right, what are your strengths? What are my strengths? Let's right. move forward on that. You know, right. His word is final. When he says something, he's, he's the boss, you know, right. But I'm here to provide him backup in every way. And then right. we've also got a lot of stuff where we, we have activists who just come up with ideas. And then the idea mm -hmm. for the state committee is, all right, is that a good idea? Something we want to put our time and effort into? And if so, right. how can we help make that idea actually happen? You know, right. That's the big thing is if you're going to, for anybody who's watching this, who's like, man, my state committee doesn't listen to me. These libertarian mm -hmm. groups around here, they all suck. Go fix them. Just show right. up. Just show yeah. up. That's how we're fixing the libertarian party of Maine is we just showed right. up and started fixing it. Yeah. I, you know, it's very interesting when I first, you know, libertarians have a tendency that if somebody shows up and they're willing to just kind of give them a spot, maybe not necessarily the chair, um, maybe in some cases, but from what I've seen, it seems like if you show up and you're ready to work, there's probably an official position that you can get. Um, but after I kind of put in some work with the party, I think it was a lot less about, okay, we do need somebody here better to have somebody than not. It was more like, we respect this guy. And we actually think that he would be a good person in this particular position. Right. And I think part of that has come through, like you said, getting there, doing the work, uh, you, you got to be mindful of people, you're still working with people. So you can't get in there and uh, burn bridges or, you know, start battles, you know, too quickly, which I've done in different organizations. And <laughs> those were atrocities <laughs> that I would, I, that I never want to repeat, you know, and, and so I think there's, I think there's something to be said about just getting in and doing the work and being observant about like the, t the, the temperature of the room you know, your affiliate or whatever, it, whether it's an affiliate or whether it's the state party or, or what have you, just kind of get a temperature of the room, get a read of it and say, okay, what's going on with the people? What are they, you know, what are they responding well to? What are they responding poorly to? And then kind of shifting your ideas to kind of match that. Um, and I think that's where you get, at least that's where I've gotten some of the, you know, the best support. And it's interesting because I get my leadership, I don't want to say leadership skills, but my my approach to leadership with my affiliate members from an old pastor of mine 
way, way long ago, I was, uh, I, you know, I wanted to work with teenagers, uh, particularly disadvantaged teenagers, ones that were maybe running around the streets doing things that they shouldn't have been doing. Um, even in a libertarian context, they shouldn't have been doing these things, right? And uh, I came in, I didn't, I, you know, I had never been to Bible college. I didn't act, I actually, at the time, I hadn't been to college at all. So I, I, you know, and I had no training whatsoever. I just was like a guy that wanted to work. And I remember going to this church and I was like, look, I want to be a youth director. And he was like, all right, let's see what you got kind of, you know, and I mean, and, and I started out kind of in as an apprentice with their current youth leader. And then eventually that person moved on and the position opened up and I was available and I had garnered some trust. And so the youth, the, the, the pastor kind of gave me the position to be their youth leader. And what was very interesting was he supported a lot of the, I mean, I had some crazy ideas back then for, for religious people. Okay. Uh, you know, I was like punk rock. I had a septum spike, you know, chains, spiked hair, colored hair, you know, big baggy pants. I mean, you know, I looked every bit much like your, your punk rocker, you know, and I was in the Midwest, no less. So here I am in Indi mid, you know, in the middle of Indiana, you know, looking way out of the ordinary. And, um, and I was like, I want to be your youth leader. No, you know, on top of that. And, um, you know, and I just had these crazy ideas. They were, but in his, his idea was as long as what you're doing is within some range of what the church is trying to do, have at it. And so that's kind of the approach that I take now is like, I'm, I'm like, all right, what's the vision that we're trying to do as an affiliate? What's this range of libertarianism that's generally considered acceptable? If you're within there, let's do it. You know, and, and, and I'm starting to get more ideas. Like I've got people, uh, you know, writing stuff now that are like, I want to start producing, you know, videos. I want to start producing um, written con content. I've got other members that are contacting other groups and saying, Hey, maybe we, you know, maybe there's an opportunity for our groups to get together. Uh, you know, I'm, you know, just a lot of things are, you know, kind of falling into place because I think I'm, I've kind of, as a leader, I've kind of looked at it and said, what can we do? Bring me ideas. And I'm not making it a narrow vision here. I'm making it as broad and wide as I can because I know that everybody's going to have different ideas and there might be that crazy lunatic with the spiked hair who was once like me out in the audience there. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they'll be, and they'll be passionate. Yeah. Right now. That's kind of where we were a few months ago. Right now we've had to really narrow our vision because we've already set ourselves on a course of action and gotcha. we don't have the resources to take on other projects that are very closely related. Right, you know, right. If if we got an influx of a hundred grand tomorrow, we could broaden our vision by quite a bit. Oh yeah, you know. But, right. Um, and, and and when I say broad vision, I don't necessarily mean spending money. Oh no, no, I know what you mean. I I know right. what you're saying. Like as far as bring me your ideas, bring me your action plans. What do we want to do? Yeah. How are we going to advance right. the cause? Um, we had that's kind of how we got to where we're at now is by expanding right. that horizon taking all the good ideas, throwing the bad ones out. We're trying to amend them right. to be good. Right. And then developing a plan of action. You know, hey, this is what our, our leadership team wants. This is what our members want. How do we achieve right. that? And yep. I think really whether you're talking about a political action committee, whether you're talking about an institute or a political party, that's what you need to do is you need to first say, what are our crazy goals? You know, like yeah. you said, Right. super broad horizons. We want to yep. end the war on drugs, you know? Right. Okay. Well, what can we do in our little neck of the woods? What, what mm -hmm. do we have control over? Oh, we can right. pass a town ordinance or yeah. we can, uh, you know, if you're in a state that has like medical marijuana, but doesn't have recreational marijuana, you can go out there and start petitioning for that. You know, there's, right. there's all these little things you can do without having to fight the entire beast all at once. Right, you know? right. And I generally am pretty good at working with people across any of the ideological spectrums, whether they be Democrat, Republican. Ironically enough, libertarians and I have the hardest time working together. 
Mm-hmm. And the reason is because I know what it is. It's because if we disagree by 5% or use one word in a way that the other person doesn't like, now we can't be friends anymore. Right. And it's like, why can't we be friends? You yeah. know, like, uh, for instance, I got called a terrorist a couple of weeks ago because I don't believe that <laughs> you can commit treason, you know? So that's crazy. It, it is. Mm-hmm. And I'm just sitting there and I'm like, you know, we should be friends. Like we should be working yeah. together. You're calling me a terrorist. And then I yeah. reacted, you know, it, unfortunately, but either way, right. it, it just comes to down to the point of we all agree enough on the important issues that, right. you know, realistically, like if we had a minarchist society, I say this to Roger all the time. If we had his society, you know, his vision for a minarchist utopia, I wouldn't complain. Right. You know, I, what, I'm not right. going to complain about the 10% taxes that would be taken in his society. Right. Uh, right. Compared to where we're at now, where 40 plus percent of your life goes to the state, I think that's a big difference. You know? Yeah. So all of it's dealing in, in, you know, people could say like, oh, that's a real pragmatic approach. You're, you're just kind of chickening out. And it's like, no. We're, we're dealing with a situation where every single day the task ahead of us gets greater. Right. Every single day the state passes new laws, new ordinances, right. spends more of your money, makes right. it more illegal for you to do more things. And yet we can't be happy about a small win. Otherwise, we're not good libertarians. We need to right. stop fighting with ourselves to that degree. Oh yeah. It, you know, it's, it's one of the reasons that I actually started my, so funny story, actually, it's the reason, um, in a set, in a sense that I joined the libertarian party. One of it, one reason was obviously because I was kind of flirting with libertarianism and I was like, Hmm, I think this is more of an idea that I can grab onto and, um, and, and make sense to me. But on the other hand, I was, I was initially confronted with what I call, you know, the lunatics of the party. So for instance, here in Florida, when I was just kind of taking a peek at libertarianism, which was more in the Florida area, so I wasn't really looking at the national level or some other state, there was a, a guy, I think he was on his way out. I don't, I don't know the full story, but I think he was on his way out about the time that I was looking in. And his name was Augustus Invictus or something like that. um, And he, like the first thing that I ever heard about him was some news article about how he was a pagan who drank goat's blood. And I was like, okay, I I get the idea that we don't discriminate based on your religious beliefs, no matter how weird they are. But one of the things that really struck me was I'm like, it's very difficult to talk to non-libertarians with something to that degree, right? And this is this is aside from any personality issues that he might have had, which I don't really, I, I personally can't attest to. But I've heard that he had some some pretty negative personality uh, uh, behaviors and whatnot. And so I was just like, you know, just that one thing, you know, I was like, man, I, that's very difficult, you know, for me to kind of wrap my head around because how am I going to go home and tell my mom, who's a super duper evangelical Republican? You know, how am I going to tell her that, you know, this guy might be the guy she wants to listen to, you know, when he's so far over there, you know? And so I was like, but then I started seeing other things and I was just like, it just felt like what was going on was a lot of fighting and a lot of bickering and a lot of um, unwillingness to really um, consider how your message is presented. It was kind of like, as long as I'm telling you about libertarianism, who the heck cares how it's delivered? And I, you know, I didn't like that. So I literally joined Toastmasters so that I could learn to speak better, um, you know, publicly present ideas. And then I joined the libertarian party so that I I was like, you know what, somebody has got to be different. And I was like, I'm going to be different after I go and get some training. So I, I literally started going to Toastmasters. I've been going to Toastmasters now since um, 
uh, probably about mid 2017 or so, something like that. And then late 2017, I think is when I got into the party, somewhere around that time frame. And, uh, you know, I, and I, and I joined. And, and since then, I've read a lot of books and, you know, articles and whatnot on communication. And that's been the heavy focus for me is, you know, like, how are we communicating? And, uh, you know, because, you know, the one thing, you know, I, I want to make sure that is if, you know, I could come in and drop some F bombs and say all these other things. And maybe that doesn't matter to some people. Maybe it does. Um, but I think what's important is to know your audience, you know, and, and if you're going out and you're like, hey, the broader the audience, the more controlled you got to be, in my opinion, from what I've from what I've observed, that tends to be what works um, as a rule of thumb. So, you know, I've, you know, I've kind of really been on this communication and as you know, and, and you were talking about this infighting and, uh, you know, and, and, and it seems like communication is really the core problem, in my opinion, that the libertarian community suffers from, is that we really don't give enough time to really practice and learn good communication. You know, and this is not to say that I'm great at it, but, you know, I'm, I'm not great at it, but I work hard at it. I mean, it's every bit as much work as it is to like, try to learn all the deep philosophical points of libertarianism. Yeah, I agree with that. I actually have a sales background. So when it comes to speaking to people, framing your arguments properly, you know, bringing mm -hmm. them into it, the, the, the number one way that I have found to get people not only interested in libertarianism, but to actually bring them into the conversation, just ask them very bluntly, what is the number one issue for you when you go to the voting booth? Right, right. That everybody has one. Maybe yeah. you'll find someone who goes, oh, I don't vote. Go, all right, well, if you were to vote, you know, come on, you know. Right. Like right. everybody has a number one issue. So find out yeah. what that is. Give them the libertarian answer to it and see what they say. Maybe they're yeah. not a libertarian. Not everybody is. That's, that's right. A, and I think that's something that a lot of people, libertarians, especially newer libertarians who are like surface level libertarians, mm -hmm. you know, they get mm -hmm. brought in like during an election campaign. Yep. They never really read anything on it or study about it. They're just surface right. level libertarians, we'll call right. them. They feel like everyone is a libertarian. And it's like, yeah. no, not, not everyone is, doesn't want to hurt people or take their stuff. There are people right. who want to hurt other people and take their things. Right. And oh, yeah. we call them statists. And there's lots of them out there. Yeah. And, you know, your little simple argument of, well, is it better to hurt people and take their stuff? Or is it better to ask them and then take their stuff? It right. doesn't do anything to them. Yeah. You know, you need to have some real concrete evidence, some real philosophy, and yeah. you need to have some examples of your idea working. And if it there isn't an you know, a real example of your idea working, like uh private military is one of the hard ones. People will mm -hmm. always come at anarchists and be like, Oh, well, how would you fund the military? And it's like, Well, hey, look, how about before we worry about funding the military? Right. We just get to the point where we can agree that right, what yeah. the, how the state uses the military is not correct. Let's start there. Yep. yep. Cause it, you know, having a private military, you have to first, I think, accept the moral argument that having a private military is necessary mm -hmm. before you're willing to even entertain the efficiency argument. I right. don't think most people who are there, on a moral or philosophical level are ready to even accept that, that argument and you can right. try and make it. And maybe the argument, maybe it's not an argument that can be made. Maybe that's why I haven't convinced someone who hasn't right, right. bought into it on a moral or philosophical level. Right. But that's my experience with it. And then the problem is though, we take that and we go, Oh, you believe that, or you don't believe that. Therefore you're not my kind of libertarian. So, right. you know, F off. And it's like, no, yeah. no, don't F off. F on. Come back to the team. We need right, you. Right. You know, yeah. whether you say taxation is theft or you say, um, yeah, you shouldn't steal people's money without them. Uh, you know, whether it doesn't matter how you phrase the word, we all have yeah. the same underlying philosophy there. So right. I think that we really just need to stop fighting amongst each other. Yeah. You know? 
I think something, you know, when I was learning, so when I first moved down to Jacksonville, I actually quit. I, I, so I moved down uh, f because my wife had, uh, who was my girlfriend at the time, she moved down to Jacksonville and we were going to do a long distance relationship. And then she was like, mm, yeah, this really isn't working for me. Um, I think you're going to have to move down here. And so I quit my job. And at the time I was just starting to get into web development. And um, so I said, you know what? I've got a good running start. So when I come down, I'm going to connect with the community. And uh, I tell you what, I'm going to take a year off and I'm going to study web development. And so I came down to study web development. And one of the interesting things is after I studied web development and then I decided I was going to get a job and I went and I, I got a job, um, I had, uh, you know, an interesting experience. And there was a, a fellow that kind of was like a... Um, I don't really want to say mentor, but more of a, um, not a coach, but just kind of like, uh, I don't know. He was kind of overseeing my development process as I was going through. And he made an interesting comment went to me one day. He said, you know, a lot of experienced web developers forget what it's like to be new. And I think the same goes for a lot of libertarians who have been a libertarian for a long time, I think sometimes they forget what it's like to be new, that you didn't always accept some of the ideas that you accept now, you know, and I think there needs to be a little bit of grace. And then I take it a little bit further, actually, and I pointed something out. Where did I, I'm trying to remember where I pointed out. I don't know if I told somebody or if I, you know, was having a Facebook conversation, but I basically said, um, there are people that are, you know, more mature and more and, and, le and le less mature, immature in the libertarian community. And the biggest gauge that people tend to use is time. Oh, you've been a libertarian for 10 years. You should know better. And I disagree with that. I think that you can be something for a long time and still not be very good at it. You know, you could be a, like in, in, in think about it in a trade, right? If you know, how many how many people have been like I've met this plumber they've been doing their business for a long time ten years and they're terrible at it you know they're they're terrible at their business they're terrible plumber whatever you know uh, you know they they could barely do the job enough to get it done but they're not really good and then maybe you meet somebody who's just really on it and maybe they've been a plumber or you know some other skill for you know a much shorter amount of time but they just seem to really have grasped everything they've grokked it right you know they just they really just took it in and really understand it well and so to me just because somebody's been a libertarian for 10 years doesn't mean that they're going to always um understand even some of the more basic principles you know and they may conflict with their you know their own ideas may conflict with their own ideas um uh, you know and then you might have people who are um good in one area but really fall in another area, you know, they're, they're really good, maybe at foreign policy, but for some reason, um, you know, I don't know, immigration or something like that, just, you know, the whole border thing, maybe that's the, maybe that's their Achilles heel. And I feel like we don't really give enough grace to other people. And, and that was, that was the impetus to my, my, my previous episodes where I talked about, like I said, I came up with these three pillars of libertarianism. And I said, for me, is a more practical sense, not a philosophical, you know, bulletproof philosophical sense. These are the three things that I want to see somebody say, I agree with, even if at some point they, uh, they, they don't seem to agree with it in the way that I would prefer, you know, and I, and I think that's, you know, as long as they can get those three, I'm like, you're a libertarian, because I, I feel like it's easier and better to say, what's the minimum that I can bring you in for, as opposed to, you know, like the bare minimum, you know, and, 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 and say, okay, I might have to give you a lot of grace. And so I, th I, th I think that's a part of the problem is that we just don't really give people grace. Um, because we have these kind of obscene expectations of what a libertarian should be. Um, and I think also, we probably don't realize how much we probably don't meet our own expectations. Yeah, I would say I definitely have high expectations for libertarians in certain aspects. Right. But in others, I'm like, you're a human. What what mm -hmm. else would we expect from you? You know, it's right. Normally it comes down to the way that they talk about the state. I will I will be like, hey, look, that's kind of gross. 
the way you mm-hmm. just said, like, right. well, as an American, I think we should respect the rule of law. Right. It's like, right. wait a minute. You don't say that. as You can't call yourself a libertarian and then say that sentence, you know, unironically. But, but I so, had that very conversation just last night. Yeah. It's, <laughs> and see, it so those people are out there. I'm not, like, I'm not being hyperbolic. They're out there. Right. And you just have to be careful too, because, you know, when I remember back when I was a constitutional conservative, Mm -hmm. I was a really, really good constitutional conservative before I was a libertarian. I wasn't a Republican. I was, you know, and so for me making the intellectual leap over to libertarianism, well, I was already as minarchist as you could get. Right. You know, the government was allowed to do like eight things and that was it in mm-hmm. my brain. So gotcha. Gotcha. When I came from that framework to being a libertarian, right. but I never used the words like non-aggression principle, um, right. zero, okay. zero aggression axiom. These things meant nothing. You know, I right. had no real interest in privatizing the roads, although I knew it was legal according to the constitution. Like mm-hmm. I, I hadn't looked through any of the things that I knew were the actual law. So then right. once I started looking more into the solutions of like, all right, well, how could we create a constitutionalist society? That's right. when I realized, Hey, this is libertarianism. And then I, I kind of was like, Oh, that's cool. You know, I found a whole new thing that I mm-hmm. could research. Well, Along the way also too. So let me back up a little bit because I have a very odd story of how I came to libertarianism. I was in the army for six years almost and I just didn't care about politics. You know, the president was my boss. Mm -hmm. That was it. That was as much as I knew about it. So I was into more of like the historical conspiracy theories. Like I wanted to know about Bay of Pigs. I wanted to know about Operation Northwoods. Those Mm -hmm. were the types of Mm -hmm. things that interested me. And then I'm on my way out of the army and I'm starting to research the Federal Reserve. And I come across a book by a man named Murray Rothbard titled Origins of the Federal Reserve. Right. So as I'm getting out of the army, just researching, you know, Mm -hmm. the Federal Reserve, how it came to be, what it does, yada, yada. I get introduced to Murray Rothbard. Well, that was kind of it's hard to like get introduced to Murray Rothbard and then not go down the journey sure, to sure. intellectual anarchy or anarchy so that's pretty much how that started but um yeah that's again interesting I, yeah it was a very weird coincidence you know right. very weird coincidence so you know on that i was introduced to michael moore in the army <laughs> oh were you <laughs> Sort of. So what happened, I, I was in the National Guard and um, I joined a unit that I knew was going to go to Bosnia uh, for a regular rotation. So this is well after the war, okay? But it's still considered a war zone because they had like 9 million landmines all over the, the country. And, you know, according to them, at least, um, you know, there was still the possibility that something could happen, right? That, th- that there, there could be some sort of violent outbreak or something like that. Um, the likelihood is that it was probably pretty low. Um, so we went over there and the base that I was at for six months was like this huge, you know, it was this huge base and it had all these amenities to it. So you had like, um, um, you, you were allowed to bring your, your computers in, you could buy TVs, you, you know, in your, in your, in your, um, uh, in your room, your area where you were in your, in your, your bunk, uh, where you were staying. And, um, so I remember going to the library and I was like looking through books and I went to the po- political section cause I've always been pretty political, uh, mostly on the social side. So I, I, I like to talk about like social topics in politics and, um, so I saw this book and it was titled, um, how oh, was it titled, uh, stupid white men and other sorry excuses for the state of the nation. <laughs> and it was by Michael Moore. And I had never heard of Michael Moore at this point. Right. So I'm like, huh. I was like, it was an intriguing title. I was like, yeah. what do you mean, stupid white men and other side? Like, wow, okay. Um, I know at the time I was a little bit less robust in my willingness to finish material. So I think I got about maybe a chapter in and I was like, this is garbage. 
<laughs> and I took it back and I was like, the hell with this. This is, this is the worst, like, this is a terrible book. I, I don't even remember what it was that I thought was terrible about it because it was like, this was back in like 2002. So this was, you know, definitely, you know, like 19 years ago. Um, so it, but it was funny cause you were mentioning like Murray Rothbard and I'm like, yeah, if only I had been introduced to something, you know, even halfway intelligent, let alone actually intelligent, that would have been nice. But no, I got Michael Moore. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I mean, my whole family is kind of Republican-ish. Mm -hmm. If, if they, you were going to call them anything, they're, they're Republican. You know, they, right. they would vote for George Bush over uh, Obama or Al Gore right. or, or, you know what I'm saying? So. But uh, at the same time, other than my grandfather, no one is all that interested in politics. Mm -hmm. You know, they're just like, all right, who's going to steal less of my money? That's right. what I'm voting for. Yeah. So uh, and for, for me, like I've never really been all that interested in the social issues. Do you gotcha. know, when people come to me and they're like, you don't care, you're transphobic. I'm like, what? No, I they're, they're people. They have the same rights as every other right, person. Right. Like. I don't know why we need to have more of a conversation than that. Right. You know, what's your name? Tell me what your name is. Yeah. That's what I'm going to call you. If right. you decide you want to change it later, please tell me then and we can change it then. I don't sure, know sure. why we need to have more of a conversation. Like, right. But that, and I'm happy to admit, like, maybe that's my ignorance. I don't think that's bigoted. I think it could be ignorant. But my point is, we have human rights. We are mm -hmm, humans. Mm -hmm. We all yeah. have the same rights. So right. to me, like the nap understanding that we all have natural rights, right? Whether you want to say like, Oh, and, and I don't know exactly. I know that the, um, I know that at one point, like gender dysphoria was classified as, you know, Oh, you have a mental disease now, but right. people who have anorexia, also have mental diseases. So just right. because someone is classified as having some type of mental disorder doesn't mean they're not capable of functioning to a normal degree. Sure, I, sure. I think people get too caught up on that. And they're like, oh, well, the DSM-5 yeah. says now they're clearly they can't even like drive a car. Right. It's like, what? No. Yeah. No, they're, they're a human being. They've, yeah. everything about them is the same. They just think they're someone different. Sure, know? sure. And absolutely. So it to me, it's like that should be the end of the conversation. I don't really care about going any further than that. Right. You know? Yeah, I, I do because I feel like there are uh, there are people out there that want to shape society based on social conversations. Um, this is what we might call the cultural Marxist. I'm not really a big fan of using labels and names because I think they, they distract from actually having a real conversation. Um, but, um, you know, I feel like I feel like that what ends up happening is if you don't address something, then you basically don't have any say in it. And then later, it's it seems to always be the radicals who kind of are driving that and then that becomes like the standard and and it wouldn't bother me so much if it weren't for the demonization of people when they don't comply that's where it really gets me and so i i, I look at all these social issues like like my in, in some previous episodes i reviewed uh white fragility the book white fragility and it was very very interesting uh one of my friends he's an anarchist as well so i'm a minarchist by the way um, but I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I think I'm a unique minarchist because most of the minarchists that I've met, uh, let me digress here, it are the type that say, well, we need this level of government because, and, and they seem to say we need it because, um, a free market wouldn't work in this particular area. Like they might say, well, we can't have, um, a privatized military. We can't have a privatized police force. I look at it a little differently and I say, well, I don't think that it's impossible, um, like in, in terms of theory, in terms of a functioning society. What I do think is that people, where I'm not convinced is that people are inclined to accept an anarchist society. So I look at it and I say, I'm not hostile to anarchy. I just don't think that humanity would permit it 
and that they would find a way to usurp it or override it um, sooner than later. Like it wouldn't even last as long as the U.S. has with, you know, whatever, you know, you know, whatever freedom, you know, this country has, you know, kind of started and kind of been based on. Like, I don't even know that it would last that long. So I look at it and I say, if we get to the point where I'm starting to be happy as a minarchist, that also is the point where I become the statist um, in a sense. And so then it also is the point where anarchy is kind of a light at the end of the tunnel. And I'm like, if we get to that point, let's take a look, you know, because I feel like other things would be in place. So anyway, I was pointing that out. Well, um, one thing too is like a lot of people, when they get into this conversation about anarchy versus minarchy, they'll say, all right, let's take the United States as it is right now. Mm -hmm. And then tomorrow there's no government and go right. ahead and have a police force, have a military. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do about the homeless people? It's like, right. wait a minute. The United States has taken, what, 200 and, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 250 yep. years almost to put right. us into this problem, and you're yep. going to give us a night to solve it? Yep. That's, that's not fair. Right. You know, like, Rome, Rome well, was not built in a day, and it won't be destructed, uh, deconstructed in a day unless you destroy it. <laughs> right. You know, there, so in order, let's say, for instance— Let's take the private military just real quickly. You know, you can say, and I can understand the argument of, oh, well, no one's going to pitch in to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Well, if people aren't going to pitch in to pay for it, doesn't that tell you people don't really care about their safety? They aren't concerned about being right. attacked. Right. Like, like people have an incentive to pay for their own, uh, their own security. And I right. can say, well, is it going to be cost effective? That's a different discussion. You know, the effect, Correct. the efficiency argument I am open for. I right. think there's an argument to be made. And I think that a right. lot of people, um, I don't think they've done the, the economic research to actually prove whether it's efficient or not. But I think that there's an argument. I think that would be right. the only argument, though. I do think that if you were going to say, all right, you, DL, you're responsible for paying for your family's security. Wouldn't you hire a security force, you know, right. like, like a, some kind of security company to watch right. your house, to watch your business, yada, yada. Right. So now is that going to be more or less effective mm -hmm. than our current system? Well, if you're a libertarian, you understand that the current system is built on rot and all it does, it's made to steal from the taxpayers. Right. So if you're going to take the system and say, all right, this one's corrupt and we know it's corrupt and it's not useful for what we want it for. And then we have this other system that will only function if they meet our demands. Right. I mean, it's just from like that common sense point of view, obviously the private system is going to work better than the forced system. Right. Now we can say, will enough people cover the costs so that it runs, but that's a, that's a different argument. Right. You right. know, so I yeah. think that just like anything else, there's a lot of nuance that goes into these discussions that oh, most yeah. people just skip right over. Right. You know, like, and, and I think a lot of people have a, I think people in general have a problem with really envisioning something in the future. And I've seen that in software development. You know, I, I went to people and I'll tell them about an idea and I'm like, oh, wouldn't this be really great? And they're like, no, nah, I don't know. You know, you're like, they're like, oh, yeah, whatever. And they, they seem uninterested. And you're like, I think this is a great idea. But if you build a, like a prototype and you show it to them and it's kind of like maybe semi-functional, all of a sudden it's like, oh, can it do this? Can it do this? How about this? It'd be great if it could do this. And all of a sudden the wheels get turning. And I think the same kind of goes for... Um, you know, goes for the whole minarchy, anarchy. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I kind of keep it open and I refuse to be hostile to it. I just say, you know, I think at the end of the day, I, I think that, uh, and, and maybe, maybe this is horrible of me to say, but I think generally people overall, not necessarily you per se or a certain group of people, but I think people overall um, want to be ruled. Uh, I'm not convinced that right now that, th that they would have it any other way. Um, and I think because of that, they would constantly find a way to, even if we got to an anarchy society, anarchy society, that they would constantly find a way to usurp it and basically yank it, yank it back out of anarchy. 
Um, so that, that's just kind of my, my perspective on it. But, um, you know, but I was, digre- I was digressing there a little bit from the, the social topic we were talking about. Uh, you know, so I was doing that. I, I read that book, White Fragility. I actually read it twice, <laughs> not just once, twice. And it, but it was very illuminating. And one of my friends, he's an anarchist, and him and I debate all the time. And he said, dude, if you want to read what that's all about, just, just go to the source, man. Go read, you know, go read Marx, you know, because that's where it comes from. And I'm like, yeah, I'm like, but people aren't going to Coca-Cola with outright Marx work and saying, you need to do this, you need to do that. They're dressing it up in different language. Mm-hmm. So I read the book, and it was actually very, very illuminating because um, I walked away in like in two or three sentences, I can say I walked away with this idea that, okay, it's being presented as white people have some attitudes and behaviors that are impeding racial progress between different groups. But when you start digging in, uh, and you don't got to dig very far, that's the interesting part, you don't have to dig very far and you find out that it's actually uh, underneath the surface, it's almost like this vine or this root that just kind of extends really, really, really far. Because she talks about like individualism and capitalism. Um, she she attacks both of those heavily. She attacks uh, uh, the idea of objectivity. Uh, you know, just all these things that I'm like, that's not what I would be expecting if you're telling me that you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a white-ish person is usually what I'm kind of considered. So if you say like, well, it, you're, you're a white passing and you have some fragility to you, it's generally presented as if, uh, you know, maybe I just got some attitudes and behaviors that I haven't really recognized that are causing a problem in the racial and uh, in, in race dialogue. But then when you find out like really the core of it has nothing to do with race whatsoever. Um, but it doesn't necessarily, I, you know, it, it isn't, I, I, don't, I don't think they couch it in Marxist terms per se. Um, you know, cause like, you know, people think of like Marxism and I haven't really read Marxism, so maybe I'm off base, but you know, they, they tend to talk about like class warfare and, you know, they, there is some issues with capitalism. Um, but individualism, that was kind of a surprise to me. I didn't, uh, it never really occurred to me that somebody would actually attack the idea of individualism and say, you know, outright, like, this is a bad thing. Um, that, 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 you know, we think of ourselves as individuals and I was like, holy wow. So it's very illuminating. Yeah. That and, is, and the reason it's go very ahead. just classic Marx, Marx and, in and, in uh, Das Kapital and in the Communist Manifesto, he attacks individualism. But gotcha. Okay. He attacks individualism because individualism leads to sin, and the only way that you can actually have communism is for a new socialist man to be created, someone who gotcha. is not selfish, someone who only gotcha. behaves. For the betterment of of society so gotcha. you you can't have rugged individualism which is only looking out for yourself mm-hmm. and at the same time have a system where everything you create is stolen and funneled back into society right you know, so you can't have individualism in socialism or in communism at least on right. an intellectual framework gotcha. which gotcha. is where that comes from yeah. Um, I, I would also recommend like if you want to get into uh, kind of the idea of, of Marxism and just read, understand too, like his books, he didn't call them, um, you know, socialism is the best or communism is going to rule the entire world. You know, right. he wrote a book called Das Kapital, talking about capital, because right. he understands that you need capital in order to actually accomplish your goals. He's right. not against capital. He's against individuals having the capital. Gotcha. And and, and tell me, so, uh, I assume that you've read enough, correct? Uh, that that book, maybe others. Yeah, I'm I'm not a genius on them by any stretch. Sure, but. sure. So so here's my theory, and and tell me if I'm wrong on this. Um, so when I read the book, I, one of the interesting things about individualism that she points out is she she attacks Jackie Robinson. Uh, not Jackie Robinson himself, but she attacks the story of Jackie Robinson. She basically says, like, look, we think of this as like some great individual story. Um, But then she kind of flips it on its head and she says, society looks at it like finally there was a black man that had the the skill to compete against white people. And she's like, that's the narrative. And she's like, this is why individualism is bad because it creates this false narrative. And what was interesting was I was like, 
I was like, first of all, I was like, I don't really think that's the narrative. That doesn't sound right to me. And so, because I was like, we celebrate individuals. Uh, well, let me back up. She said, individualism, the problem that she had, that she took with it was that it, um, it, it has this notion that we celebrate individuals that don't have to deal with insurmountable obstacles in front of them. And I was like, no, that doesn't sound right. I mean, she said it a little bit differently. And I'm like, no, we celebrate individuals precisely because they overcame barriers, even if they were barriers, they shouldn't have had to right? like, like the barrier of the color line that Jackie Robinson broke, shouldn't have really had to happen, but it did. And that's why we celebrate him. And, and, you know, to that point, the only reason we know Rosa Parks name is because she had to overcome an insurmountable odd and right. stand up against again right. the greatest leviathan the world has ever known the united states government right you know if it wasn't for the laws in place by mm -hmm. the state and by the federal government rosa parks never would have had to sit in the front of the bus as a protest she would have right. just been allowed to sit there because she's a human right. being and that's the way we treat each other so right it, so it's just oh i just realized it's 11. um so oh. it, it it really just to me it all comes down to i understand why like some people i understand why we need to be uh aware of what rules and what they're talking about as far as laws are concerned on these mm -hmm. social issues right but from a libertarian point of view like as far as the philosophy of it goes once we start getting into like the, you know, sh our trans people, do they have rights? It's like, yeah. Did you, do you remember the right, word right. people you just said? Yes. Right, right, right. You know, yeah, absolutely. That, that's the important part there. So yeah. Or the same thing with, you know, the, I just found out now there's the new term GSM, gender and sexual minorities, which I much right. prefer. Um, yeah. It's like whenever I like, I have plenty of friends, relatives who fit mm -hmm. into that category. You know, I love all of them the same just because I'm like, I, I'm at this point where I'm like, listen, I appreciate everything that you're saying. Mm -hmm. We just, there's nothing for us to do about it. Right. Do you know, like we have a quality and if we don't correct me, I'm happy to be corrected. And then sure, sure. I, I might be missing something, but it's right. out of ignorance. It's not out of malice. Right. It's, it's not out right. of bigotry. It's because it's not something that really affects me in my life. I'm trying to do like the no knock bill, for instance, that doesn't affect mm -hmm. my life, but it's right. something I have seen firsthand mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. does affect people's lives. Right. So, you know, if I'm wrong on it, I'm happy to be corrected. Just when you go to correct me, don't be rude, condescending or act like I'm wrong out of hate. Right. And, and that's the that's the element of the social aspect that I am, am, am so fine. I find so interesting. And I know we're kind of up. But how much time do we got? Do we need to kind of wrap this up? Yeah, we got to get going. David fight is about to be going on with fight for liberty. OK, so we're going to wrap this up, folks. Let me go ahead and give a close. And uh, and then we'll, we'll we will head on out. It was great talking with you, Harrison. Uh, we did di we did digress a little bit, but that's okay. If you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to hit that subscribe button to catch Liberty Liberty Dad episodes as they air. Head on over to Facebook. Uh, dot com forward slash free speech media network where the weekly episode of just me generally airs monday night at 10 p.m or join josh veals from the libertarian apothecary and me on friday night at 11 p.m for a discussion style episode of the same topic while you're there be sure to check out other free speech media shows and remember if you're a champion of liberty your business is people and your product is liberty have a great week catch you next time and we are out